welcome, welcome colleagues, friends. Um, my name is Luisa Biaosiewicz. I'm a professor of European governance at the University of Amsterdam. Um, that's my official title, but I'm a political geographer by training and currently um, a visiting fellow here at the EVM. So um, thank you for coming tonight to what we hope is going to be a very interesting discussion with this panel of experts on a topic that is certainly of great political relevance uh, across Europe, but of course not only. And the title of tonight's evening um, hints at that because what we want to look at is what's being termed a new architecture of global migration politics. And our discussion will focus most directly on two documents that are part of that architecture, two documents that have been termed compacts, Compacts that seek to shape both understandings, but also policy responses to migration. And we'll come back to this notion of architecture during the discussion in, in many ways, um, because it's an architecture of, but also for, global migration politics. And I wanted to um, lead into it um, by kind of casting our gaze back um, to some of the panics that accompanied, certainly in a number of European states, um, the signing of these compacts. Um, especially the second of these compacts that was signed in December of 2018, so just this past December, which was the Global Compact on Migration, also known as the Pact of Marrakesh. Um, because those kind of uh, panics refracted in very different ways in different national contexts, I think are quite illustrative of the ways in which these documents and the broader kind of architectures that they seek to describe were misunderstood, misrepresented, um, and in fact credited with many capacities and many responsibilities that they simply did not have. Um, so what I wanted to start with, and. Can we, can we run the video, is um, a video that was actually um, produced to um, clarify, you know, in this moment of these various panics, which actually led to the collapse of the Belgian coalition government, had very serious discussions in Italy, in the Netherlands, um, and um, this was a video that was created to kind of explain what these pacts were about. I don't think... So mine is the sound, but the narrative, I mean, very much followed the text on, um, on the slides here that you saw. Do, do you, is it possible to, um, to have um, the slides? Because I just wanted to show you, just kind of, again, to cast your minds back to some of these panics, as I said. So I picked um, two quotes from December of last year from two of my favorite politicians from the country that I come from and the country in which I now reside, unfortunately, um, especially Thierry Baudet, who is uh, jubilant after the last 
provincial elections in the Netherlands just last week, announcing that this, uh, this pact was, quote, an invitation for all of Africa to come here. Um, this was just another reminder of um, you know, kind of the unintended effects of the discussions about these pacts. And uh, one more, this is a clarification from the Dutch government saying, you know, we're not going to just jump into this in quite serious kind of uh, heated political discussions. Um, saying that, you know, rather than kind of signing um, the compact, they would seek what they called an explanation of position. And if we can have the last one, um, this map, by the way, is not accurate because at the end, you know, kind of this, uh, these, some of these countries did end up signing the compact, but this was the situation in early December. So just to kind of get you to think that this was not something very remote, but that entered into very national um, political debates and, as I said, became um, a heated topic of discussion. Thank you so much for that and somehow <laughs> to, to bring it together. So what we wanted to do in tonight's discussion, um, which actually follows a very intense and intensive full day of discussions with some people who are here in the audience as well, is to try to understand with our assembled panel of experts what these compacts actually are. So beyond these misunderstandings and the things that they were credited with doing, like bringing half of Africa to Europe, um, but also thinking in much broader terms what these new agreements, what these new um, compacts do, what kind of work they can do, and what they can do, in fact, to restructure the management of migration, but also in rethinking kind of fundamental questions of rights, of responsibilities, and very importantly, their territorial reach. Okay, so kind of thinking both in terms of architectures, but also kind of territories of mi migration management. So um, I'll stop here. The way that we're going to structure the discussion tonight is um, we have asked each of the speakers to give a kind of five to seven minute uh, position statement. Um, after this first round, um, they will be able to respond to each other briefly, and then we would like you to join the discussion. So um, let me very briefly introduce the speakers in the order in which they will present tonight. So Marianne Benbau is um, the head of the IOM country office um, here in Austria. She's worked for the IOM since 2005 and was previously the head of project management in Nuremberg in Germany. She's been involved in many ways with these very kind of issues, so both um, uh, managing a bro broad range of migration programs, actually, and I'm reading here, including the IOM's largest um, global assisted voluntary returns program and reintegration programs, so both working on integration, on counter-trafficking projects, as well as resettlement and humanitarian admission. Um, Aisha Chagda, who's um, going to be speaking next, um, is Professor of um, anthropology in the Department of Cultural Anthropology here at the University of Vienna, but also permanent fellow here at the IVM. Um, Aisha has um, written and published very widely on questions of migration, um, on questions of urban restructuring, on transnationalization, very kind of broadly conceived, um, and the work that I'm particularly familiar with and have learned a lot from is her work on migration in cities and the kind of interactions between migrant flows and urban processes. And so, in fact, her two most recent books, um, Migrants and City Making, Dispossession, Displacement and Urban Regeneration, which just came out last year, and a previous book from 2011 on locating migration in cities are, are two very important um, texts that I can say have been you know, certainly um, inspired many people in my own discipline in geography. Um, to my right is Ruth Voldak, um, who is Emerita Distinguished Professor at the University of Lancaster and also here at the University of Vienna and a fellow at the IVM currently as well. Um, so um, Ruth is probably one of the leading figures, if not the leading figure in discourse studies, um, writing on language, politics, um, especially the languages of prejudice, discrimination, and looking at the language and the discourse of the far right. Um, she's written a ton. I've um, 
I, I was joking with her earlier today that I've managed to use her latest book on the politics of fear in five different courses. So I try to you know, like stick it in into your kind of even courses that are not necessarily about discourse analysis because I just think they're really good for you know, kind of for getting students to think critically. Um, so most recently, um, she's edited the Rutledge Handbook of Language and Politics, and then of course the book Politics of Fear that I was just mentioning for which she's preparing a new edition that will come out later this year. Um, and our final speaker, um, Christoph Pinter, um, who is the head of the UNHCR office um, here in Vienna. You're trained as a lawyer, um, and you've been working for the UNHCR for over 20 years, um, your bio says, which is quite impressive. And you're heading currently the legal department here in Vienna. Um, but you say you, you're also working in Brussels at the EU UNHCR office. And so your expertise, from what I understand, is in asylum law and um, foreign law. So as you see, we've assembled a quite wide range of expertise. And we hope that understanding the compacts, and as I said, the kind of the work that they do and they can do, um, I think hopefully it will help us locate them better also within a wider kind of restructuring of global governance and I think that's the aim of this evening. So not only to look at them as tools for the management of migration but more broadly as kind of windows into trying to understand how global governance is shifting. So Marion, I will turn the floor to you and um, I will um, give you the sign when your time is up. Thank okay. You very much um, and thank you for, for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here and I look forward to this evening with a little bit of trepidation because I don't very often get to sit uh, on a podium with so many uh, eminent scholars. Um, um, and so I think my task for this evening is to talk about the global compact for safe, orderly and regular migration and I've been asked in fact to, to start with um, three points that are important. Um, the normative basis of the GCM policies that the GCM envisages and the multi-stakeholder approach that is um, a defining factor of, I think, the whole of, of, of the document itself. Um, but I want to maybe start just to recall for everybody, and I'm sure you're very, very aware that the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration isn't a document that suddenly parachuted out of the heavens um, or anything like that. It's in fact, um, we at IOM see it as a, as a sort of culmination, but also a beginning point of, of a long series of um, events and efforts by very, very many different parties to come to some kind of a framework for international cooperation on migration, which um, up until recently has, has been a little bit missing. Um, and we would maybe start, and you can probably start on, on very many different points, but we would probably start in, in Cairo in 1994 at a UN international conference on population and development. Um, where there was a very strong call from countries in particular in the Global South already in 1994 um, for more consensus and for, for the international community as a whole to get together and, and sort of figure out this whole international migration thing through more cooperation and a framework. Um, and then I, I won't take you through many, many, many different uh, fora and, and events that, that, that have been um, happening since. Um, I'll just mention maybe the UN high-level dialogues on migration and, and development in 2007 and 2013 is very important ones. And I'm sorry for being brief and I'm, I'm, I'm leaving out an awful lot in between. Um, but even then in 2013 I think we can safely say that there wasn't really a huge appetite within all the UN members to actually take the step um, and take the leap and actually get towards international cooperation on migration um, and a framework for the whole further discussion. Um, and that didn't actually really change at all in 2013, noticeably with all the members um, and, and what sort of prompted a change and galvanized the international community interaction is actually the events in Europe in 2015 and 2016. Um, and I'll just leave it at calling them the events. <laughs> um, but in fact, it was it was the situation in in particular the European Union that sort of made maybe to say the global north also realised that somehow we needed to look into a policy framework on international cooperation on migration, which is something that the global south had been more interested in for a much longer time. 
Um, which brought us then in 2016 to the New York Declaration and a few other things. Um, but the New York Declaration, I think, is, is extremely important because that's basically where it was decided by the UN member states that we would ha be having and should be negotiating and, and, and um, coming up with two global compacts, one on refugees, and I think, Christoph, you're going to be talking about that, and one um, on safe, orderly and regular migration, which, of course, for IOM, given our migration-specific mandate, um, is the one that we comfortably talk about. Um, and so, yeah, just maybe to, to underline once more that this isn't something that sort of suddenly came out of nothing, which potentially you might think if you look at social media discourses as of summer in 2018, but you might you might be talking about that a little bit more. Um, but something that's been decades in the making, really. Um, then maybe turning to the normative basis of the Global Compact on Migration and also sort of having those slides of yours in, in mind, I think it's important to recall once more that the GCM is a legally non-binding document. It is not legally binding. In fact, it is part of a United Nations General Assembly resolution, which if I remember my legal training, which is longer ago than I would like to say, per se is always legally non-binding. And in particular is legally non-binding if the whole document states multiple times that it is legally non-binding. But, you know, anyway, there seem to, be, seem to be different opinions on that. But GCM is a legally non-binding document. Um, and talking about the normative basis, it's, it's important to remember that. Um, it is a policy framework for international cooperation on migration. Um, and then if you look at the preamble of the Global Compact on Migration, I think it already contains an awful lot of important references to normative bases of, of, of the document. And I'm no longer talking about all the different multilateral and international processes that I already alluded to, but um, it clearly makes reference to the United Nations Charter. It makes reference to a number of very important and core human rights treaties, in particular the International Covenants from the 1960s and 70s, but also the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, um, ILO Conventions on Decent Work and Labour Migration, but it also references other important texts um, related, for example, to climate change, to disaster risk reduction. And if you just sort of read that second paragraph of the GCM, it sort of is um, very illustrative in pointing towards the very complex nature of human mobility as such and, mig and, 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 and migration, because it sort of covers so many different aspects of legal and normative documents that exist at, at the level of the international community. Um, and then maybe just to add, and this is not so much normative, but still extremely important that the GCM is very firmly rooted also in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and that there are very, very, very clear cross linkages between the Global Compact on Migration, its objectives and the respective sustainable development goals going, going far beyond 10.7 SDG, which is the one on safe, orderly and regular migration. Um, maybe turning then to, to the policies that the GCM envisages, and I think I probably have to be a bit more brief than I might want to be. Um, <laughs> um, just, just to briefly say that the GCM actually provides what we call a 360 degree view on migration. So it covers all aspects and dimensions of migration. It describes a comprehensive approach to migration to optimize the overall benefits of migration, but also addresses risks and challenges for individuals and communities that are related to migration and diversity. Um, it is basically, um, in, in my understanding, something like a menu of different ideas that exist and have existed in the international community for a very long time. Um, 23 objectives and basically a menu of choices of where individual member states and the international community could sort of look into how to improve global migration governance. So th these ideas I don't think are new, they've been in very many different documents, they've been discussed over a long period of time, but this is the first time when they sort of, when you have this blueprint, the, the whole menu of, you know, states, if you want to work on international cooperation on migration, you know, 
these are all the ideas that we all have. Um, you know, ma make your choice on a voluntary basis. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the GCM is a comprehensive blueprint on how states can manage migration and cooperate more effectively with one another and with other stakeholders. And maybe that's the, the last point that I should be making for now. Um, the multi-stakeholder approach, and I think that's very important and, and singular also to the Global Compact, um, that it has ten guiding principles that are described in it, and one of the very important one is the so-called whole-of-society approach as one of the GCM guiding principles. Um, the whole-of-society approach has references across almost all of the 23 objectives of the GCM, as well as their implementation, follow-up and review processes. Um, and it's basically the realization by the international community that while cooperation on international migration first and foremost is and must be a member state-led process, if you look at the local, regional and global level, there are still so many other actors that need to be uh, included in migration governments in, in partnership um, to make sure that you have an inc inclusive spirit, that you don't lose any of the important expertise um, and that, in particular, non-state actors have an essential role to play in good migration governments, and that sort of reaches from civil society, private sector, unions, through media, um, academia, diaspora and migrant associations, to, to migrants themselves, and, and everybody needs to be included in this process to make migration governance really work and comprehensive and cross-cutting in all of the mobility dimensions that migration has. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, um, I mean, it's, I mean it's on the one hand, we're trying to say that we're going to kind of give a, a, a more complex view of the compact, and yet we're forcing you to <laughs> turn it down. Yes, okay. To summarize it in five minutes, so thank you for trying. Okay, the floor is yours. Uh, you said that you don't uh, you don't have the chance to to, to uh, sit together with the scholars that we work, and the same it's true for us too. And that was the actually the one of the important uh, drives for this is that let's be together in terms of talking about those uh, documents and then um, having very different takes in terms of the processes, in terms of their consequences. And definitely, uh, this is what we uh, wanted. And um, I mean, these the global uh, compacts. I'm not going to go into those kind of their differences in terms of very much, but in terms of their spirits and in terms of the those the way that they try to turn the uh, refugees and migrant refugee and migrant uh, mobilities to in terms of the safe, orderly, and uh, predictable and manageable uh, processes which would be beneficial for all the stakeholders uh, involved in it. But they have a particular claim in doing that. They claim to be comprehensive, they claim to be holistic, which as we have also heard, and they claim to be, as the name indicates, that they claim to be global. And I and uh, but, however, it's not very clear in terms of how global uh, uh, they are that we were also talking uh, uh, today because what this kind of globality claim uh, do and what does that kind of a global gaze is, where is it? in a way located because when we look once we look at them that we see kind of the uneven geographies in terms of the uh, the global uh, case uh, uh, global uh, case uh, and it is perspectival and one could say also selective in terms of its uh, gaze. And I think it is very important that these compacts try to go beyond those kind of um, the traces of the constraints of the geopolitics of the emergence of those uh, refugee regimes which were very much anchored, anchored in the Cold War uh, Cold War pre uh, period and uh, creating 
a kind of a more comprehensive arc. But once we look at it, certain groups of people who are who compose who are part of the uh, uh, very big uh, displaced. Uh, groups and particular parts of the world and who are, for example, um, the uh, stateless, uh, uh, stateless people that who have uh, lost, uh, who need, who are in very much in need of uh, protection is not very much the uh, concern uh, of these uh, of these uh, documents, and we know that especially in South Asia, that something that was uh, Rana Birshamara also that who gave a talk here uh, two weeks ago or three weeks ago uh, was also uh, referring to it. So, and also I would like to bring in in terms of uh, looking at it that the, it is not the global. I mean, it's not a kind of a legally binding document. Document. And then, let uh, then, uh, what is the global consent about uh, these documents? So, uh, and they are not. Uh, it's not clear how the cooperation of global uh, at the global level it will work in terms of what kind of mechanisms of uh, enforcement. So, uh, it is uh, it is very uh, open. But nevertheless, I think these are very important policy documents, as Louisa was saying that in terms of that uh, not in terms of a particular arch arch architecture of, but architecture for particular kind of uh, governance. And one could ask, what do these do documents do in terms of how do they shape the environments they are produced in, and vice versa? So, uh, and in that sense, I think they are kind of performatives in terms of, uh, and then we could look at where their potency. Uh, lie and important part of the work I think that uh, lies in there the kind of the web of meanings that they establish between and the kind of the cognitive frameworks they uh, uh, build uh, by connecting certain fields together that and we heard that which I would like to underline that it in terms of the uh, mobility Abilities uh, of uh, migrants and the refugees are uh, safety and in terms of security, but also development. There is no uh, intrinsic link actually between these fields, and this is what of the one of the uh, part of the architecture of uh, the way that they uh, connect and the uh, the uh, refugees and but basically the migrants, but the refugees they become subjects of development rather than subjects of. Uh, uh, rights uh, regimes that so this connection does something and when uh, referring to the kind of the uh, multi-stake uh, the it, it holders under the banner of multi-stakeholders that what you do is a kind of a, you bring up a kind of a bundle of actors who will be uh, responsible for the uh, implementation of those uh, um, of those uh, suggestions, and then the kind of also responsible for the governance uh, of uh, these uh, what is suggested in those um, uh, governance for the uh, and the management of the uh, safe and orderly uh, mobilities, which they involve that, as you said, that in, in uh, national international actors partners, regional actors, but financial uh, uh, actors, and also uh, civil society, but also faith-based uh, organizations, so, and the private sector. And I think this is very important to think about it because it establishes the backbone of the responsibility sharing, but this uh, uh, for the achievement and the regulation of the orderly and safe mobility, but the, uh, this responsibility sharing could very easily shift to responsibility shifting where it would let the states off the 
cook. So in this kind of, uh, there here there's a very neoliberal character of the governance uh, uh, model, which does not necessarily reduce the involvement of the, uh, or take the uh, state out of it. So it is important that it is not non-state centric. But on the other hand, it brings the state in for intervention without the concomitant uh, accountability. So in that sense, I think it is important. So do you want me to? Uh, you one minute, okay. The um, and I think that when I, when I say that the, it is it, the compacts refer to particular links between agents and uh, the institutions. So, uh, but architecture does not only refer to way that those connections are made, but architecture also refers to the style of the building, which reflects the uh, period and the epoch. Uh, and the uh, place that it's uh, produced. And in that sense, when you ask the, what was the architectural style of those documents, then I think we definitely see the traces of the neoliberal world and governance uh, structures uh, there. So they did not come into uh, being in a void but they came into being in the uh, current neoliberal world through a process which, and they carried very strong traces of uh, that uh, world. Um, maybe I should uh, stop here, then I will maybe in the second round that I could tell something uh, about the, um, the way that the agents uh, are envisioned as migrants, as and the refugees. The agencies are located. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much for inviting me to this panel. I'm not a lawyer, and I'm also not a practitioner or in any way pol political science persons. But I'm interested in how one talks about migrants and refugees. And obviously, the media reporting, the way politicians speak, uh, the way this is written about, but also the visuals have an enormous impact on the construction of refugees and migrants in our societies. And uh, in that way, I have tried to look at these policy documents, which are a very specific genre, because in policy documents you have inherently some vagueness. It's not possible in a different way, because they have to be implemented concretely then in the nation states, regionally, locally, via directives and various other sort of documents. Uh, so there is an inherent vagueness. Uh, and on the other hand, I have looked at the Austrian government program, the Regierungsprogramm, uh, to which uh, politicians refer all the time when they are asked about something, whatever, uh, in, in television or in any interview, to see what the, this government now in Austria has been thinking or talking or uh, envisi envisaging for migration and refugee policies. And while doing that, of course, as you are all aware, uh, Austria has not signed uh, this migration pact. It has signed the refugee pact. And uh, already the distinction of the two categories is very interesting because one could ask who deserves to be a refugee, how are refugees defined, and how are they contrasted to migrants? Yeah, so this is already quite an interesting question. So I asked myself, why did Austria not sign the migration pact? Just from a sort of, I'm not involved in all these debates, but I'm just a listener to news, and I read newspapers, and I'm involved in the hegemonic debates as everybody else is. So when looking at these, at the year 2018, I suddenly had the feeling I was reliving 1984, sort of a new Orwellian world. Everything I had believed in was suddenly 
gone, and it was reconstructed as something different. And that is obvious when you just look at the discourse. So this is not speculative, this is really an analysis of the various discourses we are confronted with. So uh, looking at the government program, uh, the word asylum appears five times, asylum seeker appears even less. Uh, what really appears is illegal migrant. Uh, irregular migrant doesn't appear once. The word irregular is not known, obviously, in this government program or in the coalition, or maybe they know it, but it's not in there. Uh, so obviously, a, a vast amount of research has not been taken into account when drafting this program. So then from the about 40 instances of uh, the keywords migrant and illegal migrant, uh, we have 11 times illegal migrant, 10 times migrant, and otherwise migration with some kind of compositum. Uh, German loves big compositor, and so we have enormous amounts of nominalizations. So there are no agents. And if there are agents, they're actually more frequently illegal agents. Uh, now, what does that tell us? I mean, just by looking at keywords and collocations, and I don't have the time now to spread out my entire analysis, but it tells us that the attitude uh, to people who come here has shifted into criminalizing them. Because if you see them as illegal and not irregular or not displaced or all the other terms, it already uh, gives us a certain frame of understanding what this is about. Now, I said Orwell, um, and this idea came to me some weeks ago when the Minister of Interior Affairs decided to rename centers of arrival into centers of departure. So the centers where refugees arrive, Treiskirchen and others, now have a sign outside which says Ausreisezentrum instead of Aufnahmezentrum. And I had this idea, my parents were refugees. I thought, what would they say? They arrived in England in 1938 and they would have seen a sign saying, uh, departure center, so bye-bye, yeah? Uh, so what does that imply, not just biographically, but more generally, it just means we don't want you. You can come and you should go again. Uh, so for me, the whole frame, which is very new for Austrian hegemonic politics, and I must really emphasize this, Austria took in refugees many, many times, also in its historical legacy and responsibility after World War II. It took in even 90,000 Bosnians, uh, even after 1989 and the fall of the Iron Curtain. And uh, it has taken in refugees from Vietnam, from Chile, from all over, not just uh, uh, the Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia, and so forth. But now we have a frame shift from sort of a quite established system of accepting and processing refugees, which you know much better than I do, into actually not wanting them and signaling this in various ways. And I might just uh, mention two other labels. I counted all the labels and proposals which we have had in these, this one year. There are 22 new proposals of restricting migration just in this one year. Uh, not all of them have been implemented, but they have been announced. Yeah? And there are headlines in the Austrian press agency. And you also come across new words. So not only the Ausreisezentrum, but also uh, um, sicher, Sicherungshaft. That means that there is preventive detention. So uh, you could 
that is one of the proposals, detain people who come, refugees, asylum seekers, just by thinking that they might be dangerous. Uh, and that, of course, in a country which has seen fascism is really a link to something like Schutzhaft. Uh, and the other term I would like to mention is Arbeitspflicht. Uh, the idea to uh, propose that asylum seekers, refugees should work, but be, it's not slave labor, but it sounds like it, yeah? What is the duty to work? And then there was another proposal that they should get in, that it's legally very difficult, and I have no time to explain the possibility of the bit of work refugees are allowed to do, because they're not allowed to work asylum seekers when they come here, but they are allowed to earn 110 euros with certain other forms, that they should now get one euro 50 per hour. And for me, this contradicts the directive uh, from 2013, the EU directive, where it says refugees should have a dignified way of life anywhere where they arrive. So this is why I have this feeling that I'm living in a Orwellian world, yeah? that things have been redefined and renamed in a way, in very quickly, in one year, which had never been that way, which were controversial. There were always conflicts, but that suddenly the hegemonic discourse has completely shifted. Hmm. Sorry. Wrong timing for the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, thanks that I can join this panel. It's really interesting to listen to you. Um, and I was asked to um, provide some short input about the Global Compact on Refugees. Um, and yeah, it was touched upon already several times and I think you saw the video at the beginning, uh, the UNHCR video which was made before the adoption of the Global Compact and it says already a lot um, in terms of why this Global Compact and what does this compact aim for. Uh, and I think it's always good to, to remember the, the, the framework a little bit. Um, Marian also mentioned it, 2015-16, um, however you want to call it, the refugee emergency, the refugee migration emergency in Europe, uh, with globally seen still limited and modest numbers, um, made uh, the international community rethinking the whole uh, concepts of, of protection and migration. And I think this is maybe, from my point of view, the positive thing um, of it, that this New York Declaration was issued in uh, September 16 and that there was the, the objective to develop these compacts, these two compacts. And coming from UNHCR, for us it's very important to make the distinction between the GCM, the uh, migration compact and the GCR, the refugee compact, because for us as UNHCR we have a global mandate only to be responsible, more or less only to be responsible for refugees. So for us the distinction between migrants and refugees is key. Um, if we talk just about migration, uh, then we as UNHCR always lean back a little bit and say our mandate is on refugees. This is a very small mandate, even if numbers are high internationally, globally, you have seen more than 68 million people are forcibly displaced um, and 25 million among them are refugees, um, 5 million Palestinian refugees, 20 million refugees falling under UNHCR's mandate. And what we liked in particular is that UNHCR was tasked to work uh, to, to develop this global compact, very similar to what Marian has said, not UNHCR behind its desk or in its, its headquarters, but in negotiation with all the UN member states, in consultation with other international organizations, NGOs, civil society, financial institutions, companies, and you name it. And therefore, we have this weakness because UNHCR wanted to achieve a document to which more or less everybody can agree. And I think 
you, you mentioned, I think, is it global? I would say if you look who adopt or who voted for the Global Compact on Refugees, this was an overwhelming majority in the UN General Assembly. From this point of view, I would say, yes, it's definitely global. The next step is how will it be implemented and will it then still be global? And I think this is the challenge uh, um, which we have now to, to face and where we have uh, to, to make our homework. Um, I would also like to stress uh, and uh, apologize, excuse my, my repetition to what Marion has said, also the Global Compact on Refugees is non-binding. And it's mentioned in paragraph four, clearly this compact is non-binding. And you have maybe to understand the background why this is the case. There is a refugee framework uh, globally already. There is the 1951 Refugee Convention, which clearly defines who is a refugee and what rights and entitlements and obligations these refugees have. It was never the intention by the international community and also not the intention by UNHCR to create new law. We just wanted to find new solutions for the plight, for the global plight of refugees. And coming back to 20 million refugees under the mandate of UNHCR, 85% of these 20 million are in regions of origin in the poorest countries of the world. They have to, uh, bear, uh, to, to carry the responsibility. Uh, they are really um, tasked to provide protection. It's not the industrialized world. And I think this is something in Europe which we always should take into account and bear in mind. It's the others, it's not us who really do the job for the refugees. And the Global Compact on Refugees has the objective to change this, to help these countries to deal with refugees, to provide them with an adequate living, but also to help the refugees. And I think that's what you said also. It's not only about refugees, it's also for refugees and it's with refugees. So they are also, we're also part of the consultations. They are now also part of the implementation. And um, yeah, in order not to become too long, the implementation is now uh, the way forward. Um, the Global Compact says that UNHCR shall organize so-called Global Refugee Forum the first one, the first global refugee forum will take place this December in Geneva where UNHCR has its headquarters. Uh, we hope that many member states will send ministers to this meeting, but it's will not, it will not only be the states, it will also be again representatives of international organizations, NGOs, refugees, financial institutions and all the stakeholders who can contribute to finding a better sh uh, responsibility sharing. Um, and the, the objectives in the compact are to ease the pressure on the host countries to help refugees, also to find third country solutions. Um, so you also you mentioned, uh, is it responsibility sharing or shifting? We aim for sharing. We think that there are a number of countries all over the world who could help these first countries of asylum uh, to, to carry the burden. So they, there are resettlement programs, there's family unification, there are different forms of it, uh, ways of admission where really responsibility sharing could, could help. Um, yeah, we in the, in the preparation of this forum, there will be a number of preparatory meetings. Uh, one will be for the European member states uh, in about three to four weeks in Madrid together with the Spanish government. Uh, we organize such a preparatory meeting. So I think there's a lot of things uh, are ongoing uh, and uh, I think the first global refugee forum will be yeah, some kind of benchmark. How much are all these stakeholders willing to contribute voluntarily? I have to emphasize this. There is no obligation for nobody, no country, no stakeholder, but we hope that many, many will contribute, pledge what they can do, and that then based on these contributions and pledges, we will find a new, some, yeah, a new protection system, a new global protection system. Thank you. Um, is this back on? Yes. Um, thank you for um, for those statements and for keeping to time. So you know we're trying to kind of um, restrain very complex uh, questions and arguments into very few minutes. Um, I actually had a couple of questions to to you, if, if you know, and, and I'm sure you want to kind of add things to what you've said. And and the first one I think follows up on what you said um, in your statement that it's not the intention to create new law but new solutions. <coughs> Because in many ways, I mean, I think it ties into something that you were saying, Aisha, about a shift from understanding refugees as holders of rights, which of course they still are seen as holders of rights, but also seeing them as agents 
primarily, economic agents or also economic agents, agents of development, and thus agents of self-governance as well. And I think, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, there is that intention, you know, to, as you're saying, even to involve refugees in this process. And so I wonder, you know, with this shift, which is not just a discursive shift, but it is a shift in institutional understandings and practices, you know, what, what sort of new, um, you know, um, I think geographies also of responsibility this is creating or might create. So that was the first question. And the second one had to do with language um, and the language that we use, because I think all of you in many ways noted how terminology matters a great deal. And it certainly mattered in the misunderstandings of these two compacts. Um, I mean, Ruth, you said that you know, we're, it's not just a misunderstanding and this kind of... It's not just a slippage between migrant, refugee, and then we've got various other kind of refractions, but all sorts of other terms that are associated with protection, with responsibility, that now seem to mean very, very different things. So I guess that's the second kind of question to you is, I mean, are we kind of rethinking, reworking very kind of basic understandings and concepts, because I think, you know, as you opened, Marion, you're saying, well, you know, these compacts are really nothing new, but they are in some ways, because we're taking words that have been around for a very long time, legal frameworks that have been around for a long time, but we are kind of rethinking and reframing them. So, um, would you like to be the first to respond? And we, we have a few minutes for each of you to respond. Yeah, um, it's a bit difficult. I think there's a lot of um, a lot of truth and, and a lot of thought in um, and, and thought provoking ideas in, in 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 what all of you have said. And um, sort of sometimes listening to Christoph speak about the very clear cut mandate that UNHCR has in relation to protection of refugees, I sort of wonder whether that might have been an easier career choice, <laughs> because the situation for migrants um, is not quite so what seems to be rather straightforward. And I think you can see that in, in things like uh, UNHCR got to make a film while the Global Refugee Compact was being adopted, which wouldn't have been possible, I don't think, in that, in that um, way for the, for the Global Compact on Migration, simply because that was not a process that was led by an organisation. It was a state-led process. There were co-facilitators, member states sat together and negotiated. So there was no, no. It's, it, it's a quite quite different process, and and I think there are some parallelities. But I think that's one of the key distinctions between the refugee framework that we have and the migration framework that we have. And I think there are a number of them. But the refugee flame framework is at least a little bit more clear cut in terms of there is an organisation responsible for protection, and there are conventions. And for migrants, you sort of there are you know, human rights treaties that apply to every single one of us. Um, and then it gets a little bit more complex, which maybe also can explain um, a number of other issues that, that you've all raised. Um, sort of just, just, just reflecting on, on, on that. Um, yeah, I think, Yes, the, the, the global compact for safe, orderly and regular migration is, is basically, I would say, you know, the best compromise that was to be found. And let's not again forget the circumstances in which it was negotiated and, and I think to a certain degree where there was a huge amount of relief and, and, and a lot of expectation put into this by very many organisations, institutions, scholars by the global community when it was actually finalized as a text because you know despite different political shifts that had been noticeably happening um, at the international level you still had this document which is people-centered has very clear human rights references and sort of on all kinds of levels is really quite good i would say um and then and then you have the sort of uh, build up to the actual adoption and again I would say if, if from a global perspective 152 UN member states out of 193 actually voting positively in the UN General Assembly for this global compact for safe already and regular migration isn't, isn't really bad and is sort of quite global in, in terms of all kinds of um, measurements that, that you could take. Um, yeah and, and I think for now I'll leave it at that I, I'll probably have a few more thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
I mean, of course, that the member states, I mean, that I'm aware that's, I mean, how many have voted. And it is a very important process, I think, that is in terms of lots of thinking and uh, inclusion of the uh, scholars also were, and the very different stakeholders were included into the process. But still, I would like to come back to this kind of the, where that the agency is of that the agent of, that how it is envisioned. And there, I think it is a very, in those compacts, it is very important to see that this is what I was referring to, traces of that, the style of the architecture that you see there, because this is, of course, the that is beyond that, going beyond the kind of the victimhood of humanitarianism is there. That is good. And but that the uh, uh, the um, agents are referred as in terms of with the self-reliance, self-responsibilization. There is help for that. There are institutions. There are infrastructures. But this is this is they are envisaged as enabled. Uh, market-enabled actors, economic uh, actors. So that occurs a kind of a very large uh, space. And there, I, I was talking about the connections. There, I would like to look at a kind of a disconnection, where I think um, it is important because the, although there is so much emphasis, even from the film that we saw, in terms of as actors enabled economic actors, entrepreneurship, but then the, it is not talked about as labor in that sense as part of the global capitalist economy. And where that is, that is very connected, very much very closely connected to the functioning of uh, the uh, economy. And I think that is a, that disconnection in a way creates a very, uh, is, is a sign of a new landscape of politicization and depoliticization of the migrants and then the uh, refugees. In a way, it, uh, 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 by disconnecting and also uh, with the uh, uh, decentering with the state and with their responsibilities and accountabilities. In a way, it is a kind of it's wonderful decentralized, but also um, uh, de it's neutralized. The state's roles are in a way uh, uh, neutralized. And I would like to uh, bring also uh, with the last point in terms of the politicization, at one point, I think it depoliticizes where it has to politicize. But on the other hand, it uh, politicizes because this is happening as enabled actors. It is happening in a world which is marked by, very clearly marked by austerity uh, uh, regimes and where this, the, this uh, uh, acts and uh, dismantling of the uh, welfare states and erosion of livelihoods. And within there, that you are bringing that, the uh, flagging out them as the kind of the economic actors actually, in a way, fuels into the politicization in a very interesting way, which we see actually how it flows into the right wing a rise of the right-wing politics. So I think it does a lot, and I'm, I'm not saying that I'm skewing certain things, because otherwise we, I mean, of course, there is a very important aspects and prog progress in it, but still I think it shifts the uh, landscape completely. Thank you very much, Ruth. Well, <coughs> I think it would be interesting to discuss, and I don't have the answer to that, uh, why there are two documents. Um, and of course, it's all about mobility and migration, and refugees are a, s a specific category of people who move because they are fleeing for their life. Yeah? And migrants go voluntarily. Yeah? So this is sort of the simplistic uh, definition, but there's an enormous blurring of boundaries in between. And so again, I was thinking of why did these countries 
not sign the migration pact, but they did sign the refugee pact. So that's an interesting question, and I can only speculate about that, but you were asking about the language. Um, and it's obviously easier to define a small subgroup and then define who deserves to be a refugee. Of course, we have the Geneva Convention, but I remember we did a big project of uh, six countries and analyzing debates in the uh, diverse uh, national parliaments, amongst them Germany, the Netherlands, Austria, Britain, Spain, and France. And it was extraordinary what kind of criteria the MPs brought forward of how to define a real refugee. Yeah? Uh, and then, of course, can they apply here? Should they apply elsewhere? Dublin, etc., etc. So it's much easier to sign this document. I'm just saying this now in a quite maybe cynical way because there are only few people involved than to sign the migration pact where there are many people involved and it's and very different kinds of groups involved. Uh, so um, that is one thing and the debates now in the media which we have studied and not only in Austria but also in Britain we did a, a study over 10 years of analyzing all national media about the representation of refugees, asylum seekers and migrants is that these terms merge and in the common sense perception of many people it's all the same. Yeah, they're all strangers, and they're taking something away. So that is reinforced, and you, I should just said, we are in times of austerity, although Europe is so extraordinarily rich. Yeah? I mean, uh, Austria is the fifth richest country in the world, or I think. Uh, so in that way, of course, the resentment is easily fueled. Yeah? So uh, why should they get more money than we do? Yeah? Instead of saying, well, maybe the salaries should be raised from people who earn very little money and which, whose salaries have not been raised for a long time. But the resentment is fueled, and in that way, um, migration has become this hot topic and everybody's seen as a migrant. And that was what I was pointing to, not just in the British newspapers, also in the Austrian ones, and in the IFD is very similar in Germany, and I'm not talking about Hungary, etc. now, is that they're all threatening, they're all going to take something away, and then they're terrorists and, and whatnot. So there is all, no distinctions even, and it's very easy to merge them all, and in Britain it's also merging the EU migrants. Yeah, so everybody is actually strange. And I just wanted to add something about language. There is a specific interesting issue about linguistic skills. Linguistic skills or language competence have become a gatekeeper in many countries for migrants. So you have to have levels of the European framework which was never created for tests. It was created for teaching second languages and it's been adopted in a very strange way uh, to test people. Uh, so they are tested in B1, A1 and whatever levels uh, to be able to work in work permits or to enter the countries or whatever. What has happened now in Austria is an emphasis on language which is interesting for linguists but actually very new uh, and that means that you can only get certain social benefits if you have level B1 in German. Now, level B1 is high school German. That is, many Austrian kids don't have level B1. Yeah, many people don't have <laughs> level B1, or they should have C1 English, which is even almost already community college or further education. So suddenly language has become the obstacle and gatekeeper, which is in the multilingual Europe, which we are all proud of, yeah, and was one of the constituents of Europe, is really totally contradictory. And I did want to mention this specific issue about language. Yeah, thank you. 
Um, why do, do two documents? Uh, I can just answer from, or yeah, from UNHCR's point of view. Fortunately, two documents. <laughs> and I ask myself uh, all the time since the beginning of this panel discussion, but it's a coincidence that Marion is sitting over there and I'm sitting here. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, I. No, no, yeah. <laughs> We often sit together. <laughs> but you are fully right that there are a lot of uh, parallels and overlaps in these two documents. And, uh, and I think uh, that's, uh, that's good because there are a lot of similarities uh, and you cannot really split these things um, in a way that there is uh, no connection at all. This would, would just be wrong. Um, the other question you raised, Aisha, is uh, concerning but I've never looked at, I must say, through the lens of economy that, uh, and, and neoliberalism, I think you mentioned. Um, I think this is an, an interesting thought. Um, I, I came from another side, um, just um, having a look at refugees in these poor countries with who often do not have any possibilities. And uh, we all know from TV uh, and, and, and news in the evening, the refugee camps and the poor refugees and uh, they have to wait there until they can return and, and hopefully they will get some food and some medical treatment. And it's, it's a considerable effort on the part of UNHCR to, to change this attitude also. So we, we, we normally avoid refugee camp situations. Uh, we always ask host states to include the refugees in their, yeah, all over their territory and in cities and, and wherever. Uh, and uh, we think it's worth investing in them, yes. Um, and But it's not only labor, maybe, uh, to say also this. It's also um, a lot of uh, education uh, or um, uh, what I found interesting, one of the priorities of the Global Refugee Forum in December is energy and infrastructure. Um, so also to support the host states, uh, saying, and I think a good example is always the Lebanon with four million inhabitants uh, in the size of the province of Upper Austria um, and one million refugees. And this is now the sixth or seventh year um, that they have troubles with infrastructure and, and energy uh, and uh, water and uh, waste management and you name it. I think that's logical and I think Sorry, and I think to to invest here um, as the international community, uh, as uh, as the business, uh, with the help of the World Bank and others, um, is is a good investment um, to yeah to boost up these states and the refugees uh, at the same time. Thank you very much for that. Um, so I, I'm sure you all have much more to add to the discussion, but we wanted to hear from you, whether with questions or other contributions to this discussion. So Christoph, I see you've got a hand up. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, good evening, my name is Christoph Bender. I'm with the European Stability Initiative and uh, visiting fellow at the Institute here as well. I have a very simple question. Um, what do you think um, that these two compacts will deliver in terms of concrete results, concrete effects? Uh, what will they have and uh, well, which ones? And let me provoke you a little bit. When, we, when I look at Europe, I see two effects, but the, at least at the short term, they look rather negative to me. Um, we have a lot of, you know, we have the Human Rights Con Convention for Human Rights, we have the Refugee Convention, we have a lot of EU uh, legislation on how we should decently treat refugees and migrants. Yeah? So there's ample opportunity for EU member states to do this. The problem is not legislation, the problem is how we are implementing this, right? So in this sense, I think we cannot really expect anything um, new or anything uh, you know that will really make a change but i think what we have seen in the run-up to the um, signing of the two documents is that we had allowed sort of the far right and in some countries even the sort of the uh, center right yeah, to basically jump again on their favorite theme of you know talking about uh, the refugee crisis and all the problems that has brought about migrants, about half of Africa basically being on their way towards um, Europe. I think this had a very, very clearly negative effect in this sense. Um, then when we look at um, the fact that 
not only a few Eastern European countries, but also kind of you know very rich countries like Austria, Italy, you know, have not basically been able to put signatures to the two documents. I think internationally this has a very negative signal effect, right? So if the richest countries on this planet are not willing to basically sign even two non-binding documents, you know, why should others do this? And then when we look sort of more internationally, um, what, you know, what, what difference will this make? How, how many more refugees will be directly resettled? How many more refugees will be helped and assisted to live in decent conditions in the poorer recipient countries, you pointed out? How many, I don't know, refugees, or how many people will be saved from drowning in the Mediterranean? How many people will be spared from torture and unhuman treatment in Libya? How many migrants uh, will be um, allowed to m migrate in a decent way into a better future? Thank you for that. Let's um, let's take another couple. Please go ahead. Ms. Mitchell Ash, um, I'm going to start because I'm a historian. I'm going to start with a, a, a memory. Um, this is 1992. Some of you may re have been alive then, and maybe even remember that there was a refugee crisis in 1992. Uh, at least in Germany, it was called that. Uh, all the main actors were asylum seekers and the asylum provision of the German basic law was changed as a result. Um, but I want not to remind you only of that, but of a speech that the German federal president, Richard von Weizsäcker, made at that time. And, and I remember this extremely because I was present at, the, at this speech, in which he said, at the time it was mostly Africans, uh, in the perception of some people, anyhow. Um, but he said, you know, <laughs> there are billions of folks out there, uh, and they aren't doing so well for various reasons. That's what he said. Und sie werden kommen. Populist. Yes, we have to remember this. Yes, he was not a populist, quite the opposite. He was simply trying to wake people up <laughs> to the demographic realities uh, of the world and, that, and to simply point out that these have political implications. So I, I, want to start, I want to have started with that so that we don't get caught up in being too entirely wrapped up in contempor the contemporary character of what we're involved in. Uh, these are long-term trends. But the, the second point, and perhaps the more important one for me, has got more to do with political science than it does with history. Um, Ruth my, will be sensitive to this. Uh, there's a <laughs> semantic trap uh, here that we are not falling into speaking English, uh, but that is there if you're in German, speaking German or French. In English, you can distinguish between politics and policy because they're different words, and in theory, at least, they also have different reference, although, as we know, they don't really have different reference, they mix all the time, and I'm going get, to get, get that in a minute. But I wanted to have at least made the point that if you're speaking French or German, this is not so easy, because it's the same word <laughs> for both. What the st and the struggle for political power is also politique. Um, and uh, most folks really don't think very hard about what the differences are. <laughs> they just say politique. Uh, Foucault solved, tried to solve this by saying it was all a pouvoir, or mach, macht, and you could just throw it all in one pot. This doesn't really work, and we know it doesn't really work, but people were fascinated and still are fascinated by Foucault anyway, uh, for other reasons. What I want to do now is, is turn to you folks and say, and ask, is policy also politics? Isn't there an impl implicit politics behind the hope, I will put it as a hope or the dream, that management will actually solve the issues we're discussing? Um, I'm putting it deliberately in this provocative way because I think it's, uh, there is a kind of an implicit hope there in much of the discourse we've been discussing that seems to me to be terribly naive. <laughs> um, and it might be useful to actually bring it up to the surface and 
talk about it. Um, I don't mean to say what you're doing is hopeless. That's not what I'm trying to say. Please understand me. Of course it's important. <laughs> but I'm trying to get a handle on what the status is of what it is that you're doing. Because when there was a talk just now about politicization, um, this can't be said in German, <laughs> except that it is said all the time, politisierung. But what does that mean in this case? Does it mean converting something into policy and therefore take, making it apolitical? This is one possibility. If you mean policy, the policy meaning of the term politik. But that's not what it usually means. It means something bad that's being done to interfere with good policy making. Is that really enough? And I think cons considering how important these two questions were, and I think they're kind of getting um, at the very heart of what these things are supposed to do or what they intend to do, I'll let you answer first. And I think coming back to your kind of distinction, because I was trying to think of what it would be in Italian and what, you know, kind of politicization, like you say something's politicized, it is a negative connotation. It means that it has become the kind of an object of, you know, kind of party politics. That's what it's been reduced to, not what it should be. But I'll let you answer. Um, and Christoph, I don't know if you want to start. Um, I'll pass you. Thank you. Um, I don't really have a f an, an answer to your question. I think I think we have to see, um, and there is still hope that there will be improvements so that the Global Refugee Forum will have um, some kind of success in a way that states pledge and contribute and come forward with ideas and not only states but as said before also the other stakeholders and uh, you said uh, don't expect anything new um, I'm not so sure maybe it is not new what we, what will come up but I think if we have uh, a broader basis of stakeholders taking care of refugee issues supporting um, host states um, taking um, uh, or sharing responsibility through resettlement programs, family unification and maybe other ways. I think this would already be a step forward and you mentioned uh, will management solve the issue? I don't think so, and, but I think this is not the aim. You, you will not, because of the Global Refugee Compact, um, solve the refugee plight uh, globally, but if we manage to improve the situation for both refugees and countries hosting refugees, I think this would already be something. Yeah, I think this is for Marion. I will Marian, yeah. the, the very difficult <laughs> Yeah, I, I wanted to maybe um, just briefly turn back to the question of agency again, and, and for us not maybe to forget that there is a, a bit of a distinction again between the global compact on, on refugees and the one for migration, a safe, orderly and regular migration in terms of it's fairly clear in the document at least that the agency for the GCM is with states because it's a state-led process and, and it's a sort of fundamental principle of um, everything that we do, that states are in the driving seat. Um, so in, in terms of that type of agency, I, I think it's, it's, it's not so unclear. The question is sort of what happens next. Um, the, the shared responsibility that I read out of the document, and I might be a little bit naive, is definitely a shared responsibility between the UN member states, be they receiving countries, uh, sending countries, transit countries, all three at the same time. And I think we talked about a number of countries throughout the day where actually migration is so complex that they're not sending or receiving or transit, but all three at the same time, just because migration itself is such a really complex phenomenon that sort of touches on every single aspect of human life and is not something that lends itself to straightforward and simple answers. Um, just because it's complex, because it's an individual level at the same time, it's a, it's a, an issue of, of policy and an issue of politics. And I'm not going to get into the d German semantics of that, but I, I think what, what you say is extremely um, important and it sort of touches on the essence of human being, um, Sein. Um, and and on, on all the concepts that we have of, of, of society, of, of um, psychologically um, motivated concepts of, of groups and sort of how do I define myself in a group? I'm, I'm in a group, I'm sort of, you know, and, and migrants potentially in a, in a nation state, 
are not of that group because they do not have that nationality. And so you have the whole sort of psychological aspect of, of being part of a group or not being part of a group that comes into that that leads to a lot of unwelcome and and um, unwanted aspects of, of what it has to do with migration, xenophobia, discrimination, and, and so on and so forth. And I think um, I'd like to see the GCM as a, as a positive step in the right direction in terms of it is human rights based. It makes very, very clear um, distinctions in terms of different types of migration which are important. Um, there's the GCR in parallel, which is complementary and specifically deals with refugees as particularly protected groups of migrants, if I'm, I'm not trying to provoke, but <laughs> if people move their migrants. Um, um, I, I, I think that's, that's very important, and I would like to sort of also mention the link once more between the GCM, um, the safe, orderly and regular migration, um, and the sustainable development goals, which I think is an important one that we can't underestimate because that is all about reducing poverty, essentially in very many levels making migration work and so do the SDGs also have a very neoliberal market-oriented approach to them. I haven't even started thinking about it and I don't have a question. I'm not quite sure whether I want one actually, but <laughs> you might give me one anyway. But sort of, you know, there, there are so many different ways of, of, of looking at migration and I think there's, there's so much expertise out there. Um, and I think that's maybe one of the things that the GCM might also contribute to, which is a small step, but an extremely important one is to, to make sure that we all together work on the facts more, on data. Um, and that we actually, at one point in time, will have a basis in terms of data and statistics and understanding of what actually happens in migration to actually really start working on the evidence-based policies that we think are extremely important. Okay. Well, I, I was going to ask the two of you, I mean, since you've talked about language and who, I mean, kind of back to your point of who is made the object of policy, or who is made the object of politics, which is not necessarily the same thing. So I don't know if you want to kind of... Actually, but you... It's okay. Um, I would like to actually say something positive about these two documents, because even if, if um, obviously, we don't see any positive effects yet, yeah? But um, I, I mean, this is speculative, of course, but what I have experienced and what we have been able to see over time is that certain documents can shift discourses. So if I read the migration document and also the refugee document, they provide certain ways of talking about migrants of all kinds. I mean, you know, there are very mi different migrant groups. They're very privileged migrants. I was a professor in England. I was very privileged. And then there are very poor migrants. So I think a lot has to be s specified still for whom is what. Yeah? But um, nevertheless, it enables a different way of talking about migration and uh, people who are in plight yeah, and who have to flee and enable uh, in order to b stay alive. Yeah? And it would, that would be something which I think the NGOs or uh, organizations could really do is to enable a different discourse uh, to kind of sickle down. Yeah? So if these documents would would be summarized and simplified in ways that everybody could download two pages and understand what they're about. I'm now a, an applied linguist, and that is what we do. Uh, made comprehensible and not, you know, very fat documents with lots of uh, Amtsdeutsch yeah, and difficult nouns and directives and numbers and all of that. Uh, they could have an effect uh, if they would be propagated in many different spaces. Uh, so you talk about migration in school, here you are. Yeah? So this 
for this to have any effect, they would have to really have an impact on the way the hegemonic discourse is formed and sort of cut through this, is in Austria and in the Visegrad countries, terrible way of criminalizing people who move. Uh, and I think that would be a way to do it um, because there are very important things here. If you look at the verbs which are used about what do migrants do or how should one cope with them, they are very positive. You save lives, you facilitate, you enhance, you ensure, you strengthen. They're all very positive ways of talking about actors. And uh, I think that would be a way forward to sort of prevent only the negative effects. And the other thing what such documents enable is legitimation. So also in argumentation, you can refer to these documents. Uh, but what is missing is any ways of enforcing them. And that is, of course, the same with the climate. All, all these global initiatives cannot be enforced. And uh, in that way, they depend on governments, goodwill, whatever. I, I will come to this, the politics and the policy question. I'm lucky that I'm speaking in English because I think there's a big difference in terms of it. And then um, the policies always entail politics. And so uh, not all politics could translate itself into policies, but uh, I can't think of a policy uh, which does not have political dynamics uh, behind it. So uh, in that sense, um, I think I am using it, very uh, um, making the difference between them. And in terms of the politics, of course, you can't talk about the politics be without the power and power hierarchies. So, uh, and all these also flow into the policies. And the policies might be a very good window to look at the political dynamics and the power relations in the societies at that particular uh, conjuncture. So, and then coming back to the, what is wrong with the investments? Of course, nothing is wrong with the investments and nothing is wrong trying to reduce poverty. Uh, but I, let me just, I mean, I know we are running out of time, but I will just give one example. I have worked on three cities where um, they were really um, disempowered cities, they were poor cities. But uh, they had a period of 15 years. One is in Germany, one is in US, and one is on the border of Turkey and Syria. And uh, so very different geographical locations. But they all those cities tried to generate wealth by attracting investment and corporate capital. And of course, also that the state uh, investment partly. And most of those kind of what we are talking about are public private uh, co uh, enterprises or partnerships. So what happened is that the money came actually in within the 15 years money investment capital came but at the end of the 15 years that the disparities in those cities all of them increased and the city debt also uh, increased. So uh, coming those kind of investments do not guarantee actually in terms of how it flows uh, into it. So there is nothing wrong with in terms of those aims and desires, but I'm just asking in terms of whether these are the very good partners to make these desires achievable. That's all. Thank you for that. So I know there's a number of questions, so we'll take these three. You've been patient, and then you and Luke. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Beirut Bayad, and I'm a physicist, nuclear 
uh, analyst, it has nothing to do with it. But anyway, uh, I have two questions. One uh, uh, toward you. Um, you mentioned the impact or the influence of neoliberalism. Uh, could you uh, stress it a bit more to understand it? A bit more, and the second question is: is a is a is a technical question, of course. Uh, uh, within the documents, is there any? Uh, it, uh, does it have been in, uh, taken into account uh, the fact that we have uh, social systems in the nation states, social systems which are, which are closed? They are. Uh, they have definite uh, input and outputs, for example. If you have a migration within the system, uh, how could it be managed? I mean, as, as long as you have somehow closed systems, you know, the social system of each country, uh, in Austria, Germany, or wherever, you have social systems uh, which are in the, within the nation state organized with uh, clear input and output. You cannot over, stre over uh, uh, how to say, over stress it. it. Does the document take that the fact into account? You know, I, uh, I, so right now, I'm sure that the countries in Europe they in, in the context on the political and the uh, immigration context of now, they would have no problem to, to absorb the migrants. But in the future, if the, t if the number of, of uh, migration or mi migrated people um, increase hugely, then how the social system can manage it? The compacts actually specify both, you know, kind of recognizing state sovereignty and, you know, kind of are forward looking. All right, um, please go ahead. Hello, oh, my name is Marlene Tumar. Uh, I came to Austria uh, 20 years ago because of the UN. And uh, when the refugees came to Austria, so I was helping in uh, Hauptbahnhof. And uh, later, uh, when uh, Mr. Pinter sent a, a thank you letter to Train of Hope, I also got a, a thank you from Gabriella <laughs> because I was uh, helping uh, there, so uh, she knew also that. And um, I saw the shifting, as you said, Ruth, with the way how they have been welcomed, the refugees then, and how people were asked to bring, uh, um, you know, anything they could offer uh, from clothing to whatever. And uh, everybody rushed and helped. But later on, the, I saw also the fueling, you know, against the refugees because I'm, uh, I have a very um, uh, good uh, uh, experience with them and I've been helping them and I still help them. And I see how they are blocked, you know, in many ways when they want to rent an apartment. I try to help them, you know, to translate. And then the minute they know a person is from Syria, immediately the apartment turns to be, you know, not available and so on and so forth. And then, uh, you know, and when I talk to the refugees, uh, I know doctors and uh, engineers. And the doctors, as you know, they study in Latin, so the words are in Latin, and uh, they, so they ask them to have C1 and so on. So they're hitting a wall, you know? I mean, they want to, to work, they've been working like 10 years, 20 years back home, and now they are just pulling their hairs because they, they can't work. They just have to finish the, the uh, level of uh, language. And so, and they've been degraded so much, you know, and they see this degradation. My question is, when the refugees come here, or wherever they go, can the UNHCR or, uh, I, I don't know, or, or IOM <laughs> do something? Uh, maybe UNHCR, I heard Christoph saying that to follow the state, you know, that's uh, to about the improving the conditions reception to actually yeah, ensure other yeah, rights. I see a lot of, uh, 
refugees, uh, they're going wrong because they have, uh, you know, they have the time, not the work. Yeah. Longer term perspective. Thank you. Thank you. And unfortunately, this will have to be our final question. Luke. Um, my question is about what the either of the two compacts uh, would say about one of the big political debates we had during the refugee crisis in Europe, particularly over the, the I'm thinking of the debate over the use of quotas and this argument that was going on that I think Renzi started was taken up over all other, by many other states. Um, and it seemed to me that this uh, had two big defects in it. Uh, first was the notion of responsibility sharing, uh, so f I, and which is language I've heard tonight as well, and I support that language, but it can mean many things. So responsibility sharing could mean financial markets paying the costs of resettlement of refugees, for example. It doesn't necessarily need to mean nation states, presumably. And secondly, it, it seemed the agency, which is, again has been taken up tonight uh, really strongly, the agency of uh, migrants is dialed out if in a quota system almost by definition because they didn't want to go to many of the countries that were being hit over the head and saying they had to take uh, refugees. Um, so I would just be interested in what the kind of policy frameworks that the, uh, you're talking about, the compacts, would say about an issue like that that clearly had such huge political salience in European societies. Thank you for that. So I'll, I'll let you have a very quick round of response because then unfortunately we have to close. Who would like to begin? Um, I'd, I'd maybe be a, a bit provocative and I apologize in advance uh, about the um, social security closed systems. There's not a lot of wording in the Global Compact for safe, orderly and regular migration on that. Um, but what we know for a fact is that International migrants make up around 3% of the total population, but they contribute 9% to the global GDP. Um, and they contribute 4% more to the global GDP than if they'd stayed in their origin countries. So thinking provocatively, we could sort of discuss about wouldn't it actually be fairer to allow migrants to work earlier, to contribute more, and then to actually have a portability of all the social systems that they've paid into, while at the moment very often they pay in for years and years and years and then they return home taking nothing with them, which essentially also in terms of um, making migration work in terms of development is of course not a very positive aspect. So there is a certain amount of wording on, on social security systems and basic access to services in the GCM. Your specific question about the closed uh, social security systems that we have isn't addressed like that, but I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure whether I would agree with the basic assumption of, of that notion in general, given that we know how much more productive migrants can be and are if, if we let them. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the, 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 with the social securities, I also I have difficulty in terms of envisioning that. I mean, how you see those kind of closed systems in uh, uh, in a way, but on also on the other hand, it is not necessarily only the um, the kind of the closeness that you are talking about is not under the monopoly of the migrants or the uh, refugees. I'm an EU citizen, and I have succeeded to spread all my sec uh, social security benefits and pensions every possible country of that in EU you can think of and also North America so I mean it's nothing to do in terms of that the being a kind of the uh, migrant and then the refugee within this kind of the uh, the kind of the uh, systems but it poses questions about what kind of a construct EU is in terms of this kind of the commonalities because you can't even uh, collect uh, 
collective uh, pensions, and then that's, I mean, in terms of some of us who had been exposed to that, really we see a very different face of the uh, EU. So I'm not sure about that kind of this social closeness goes to the really for the migrants and then the uh, refugees. We should spend another two hours at yeah. least, <laughs> unfortunately. But I mean, if the two of you want to comment on you know, the other two questions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I would like to say something about the quota system, yeah, which you asked uh, Luke. I think uh, the problem is that how do you deal with the people who are coming? Yeah? And I think that quotas basically made a lot of sense, or would have made sense, if the standards in the various countries uh, which were the, the refugees would have been distributed would have been quite, you know, comparable due to the living standards there. Yeah, you can't expect Norway in Romania or something, yeah, and, and the prices, but, but this is not the case. And the other thing was with the quotas, again, if the, as far as I understand, what was decided by the heads of state, they should have implemented it. It was a decision by the heads of state in the European Council. Uh, not enforcing these things made the EU extraordinarily weak in my eyes. Yes? And I think that is a big problem that even directives and possibilities and policies which could be enforced in the way that there is a sanction if you don't do that. Well, think of things, yeah? Uh, there was even money suggested to be given to the countries if they take those people. So there was so, so many other fears and anxieties created about that. But basically, in it's difficult to find ways of how to distribute people in some kind of fair way. And that people didn't want to go to Hungary is completely understandable if, if they're treated in, in terrible ways or uh, to Poland or wherever they didn't want to go to. I just would like to say one more word in comparison there. I think that's the problem, that there is no EU-wide asylum policy. So maybe that would be one thing if that could filter down to the EU. And that was the big issue 2015. You could always blame the EU, although it was always the heads of states who decided that they didn't want to follow this or that decision. So if there would be an EU-wide agency, asylum agency, that would be, I mean, if you compare Sweden and Austria, these are two worlds. In Sweden, a refugee can work from day one. Yeah, here they're, they are not allowed to work. They don't have to pass a language test anyway. Even migrants don't have to pass a language test. There are two years offered for integration and language learning. And then you get money if you also do an enroll. If you get work, you can also stop going there, which is probably not good for your language skills, but you you can do all that stuff. And when I was telling my colleagues in Malmö about what is happening here, they said, I think we're in a different world. It's not comparable. Yeah? So they get paid the same as a Swedish worker would get paid. It's the same trade union-wise decided. So the security payment, social systems, the same. So, uh, because they say human rights, everybody is equal, why should they be treated in a different way? So, there are completely different approaches, and that makes it so difficult. Um, thank you. Yeah, just to add very briefly, um, UNHCR is also supportive to the quota system. Um, we think it would have been a good opportunity to manage the situation in 15 and 16. 
Um, at the same time, I fully agree that the weakness of the quota system is the different situation in all the EU member states. And this is maybe uh, the member states to blame that in the 20 years before, uh, they didn't manage, despite all directives and, and regulations, to come to a, some kind harmonized asylum space. Um, briefly to the social systems, there's nothing as far as I know in the Global Compact on Refugees either. Um, but I think we are rather talking about countries where there is no social system at all. And that's the challenge for the refugees to, uh, to, to survive without a social system uh, in these countries. So therefore, that's what we were discussing, uh, the investment into the refugee population in the host countries uh, is uh, so, so important uh, from, from the point of view of UNHCR. Uh, and to your question, um, what can UNHCR do to um, yeah, to, 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 to advocate with states uh, to, to improve the integration policy, if I may uh, summarize your question uh, as such. I think um, you have to, or one has to understand the role of UNHCR and the different operations. The role of UNHCR in a Western European country is to, to monitor the compliance of the policy, of the state policy with the Refugee Convention. Uh, this is, uh, as you know, the Refugee Convention contains the, the definition of a refugee and the entitlements and obligations of refugees, but it doesn't say a lot about many other things. So what we can do is to work together with states to, to advocate, to suggest, to make proposals for a better integration policies. Uh, and I think we do this to a certain extent also in Austria. And I think uh, not only because of us, but we were quite successful in the years 15 and 16 with a new integration law, maybe with its weaknesses, but at least there was an integration law with uh, more money for the labor market service, uh, which then introduced competency checks for refugees, with more money for German classes all over Austria, already in the asylum procedure and not only after recognition of protection. And this is now, this is now the reverse trend. Um, so since about one year or one and a half years, we see a different policy. Uh, we see the cuts in all this uh, funding. Uh, we see a new social aid law um, limiting access for refugees uh, to, to social aid. You know it, so I don't have to explain all this. Uh, but uh, what we can do is to, to say we think this is the wrong approach. There are about 90,000 persons uh, being granted protection since 2015 in Austria, which is quite a, a high number for a country like Austria and compared to the past. But now you need from our point of view, to invest into these people um, and not to uh, to yeah to stigmatize them. Thank you for that, and I th and I think this is a kind of great way to close because I think the question that we raise is okay, what can what can these documents do, even if they're not binding, and what can actually institutions like the IOM and the UNHCR, but I also. I would also add EU institutions, which have been kind of here in the background. I mean, if states are not taking up the obligations, so forget the non-binding documents, but the legally binding obligations they have under the convention, I mean, perhaps there is something, you know, more than certainly could have been done at the EU level. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Um, thank you for your questions. Thank you so much for your contributions. But I wanted to thank um, Aisha especially for organizing this, which followed a very, very interesting day of discussions and debates that also touched upon many of these questions. So thank you for so much for making this possible. Um, and thank you for the discussion. <laughs>